Hello, everyone. I'm here with Lauren Hubbard running to represent the 22nd Congressional District of California. This is a district that was formerly represented, and I use the word represented loosely here, by Devin Nunes. It's now an open seat, and Lauren is here to fill that seat and actually represent the people in this the district. Lauren, thank you so much for coming on the program. Well, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Really excited to be here. <laughs> Happy to have you. So uh, I've got so many questions to ask you. Uh, first and foremost, what made you want to run for Congress specifically this year? Because I think that a lot of us are anticipating a loss of the Democratic Party uh, of the House. So assuming you're elected, you are likely facing the prospect of divided government, which means that it'll be a little bit difficult for you to accomplish anything. What made you choose this moment in time? You know, for me, running for Congress was not something that I really actually even wanted to do. Um you know, as my wife will tell you, we are very happy just being existing in our life, current life of going to work, raising our kids and, um, you know, going and planning for those family vacations and things like that. We're happy to just be that. But I think what is what is really telling about it and running for Congress is um, I don't have to. I really don't mm -hmm. want to, but I need to. Um, something to be said that if I don't do it. I really don't know. We put a lot of faith in our elected officials right now to get things done. Um, and they seem to want to screw us at every turn. Um, so for me, what brings me into this race is, you know, I was born and raised here in, in the Central Valley, which is where the district is. Um, I was born to a single mother and I had lots of uh, unofficial aunt and uncles. And so I really know the importance that, that community plays to the success of our future. And so for me as an activist in my uh, professional work. I'm an operations manager at the Regional Water Quality Control Board, so I'm focused on environmental justice. I'm the racial equity chair at the Water Board. So those things are very community-based, and I bring that into this um, into this congressional race. So I really am running because the challenges that we are facing and the people in this district can tell you are ones that are not political talking points, that we actually have real lives, and there is a concern to put it mildly, that the people in Washington have no idea what the hell they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And when uh, people who are running for Congress make it very clear that they don't want to run for Congress, I immediately trust them like a thousand percent more <laughs> because who would want to run for Congress? I mean, the institution itself is essentially incapable of governing. So wanting to be a part of that mess is it seems very unpleasant to me. And, and so the fact that you acknowledge that is actually really nice because it, it's the people who I think anyways, want to run for Congress. So you got to look out for the people who talk about, well, you know, I, I've always wanted to be a member of Congress since I was a child. That's extremely strange. And, and you know, if you're running, it's this a is a self -sacrifice. answer. It's a total Ted yeah. Cruz answer. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you, you should want to run because you see problems that aren't being addressed. And that's why you're running. And that's why I think it's so it, it's so perfect. Uh, talk to us about your platform. What is it that you support? There's basically an infinite amount of issues that need to be addressed. But uh, what are you going to kind of primarily focus on if you're elected? With, with, with my experiences here, um, you know, I have uh, worked at the Department of Social Services here at Fresno, um, really on the ground level of getting to know our benefits program. So those social security programs like uh, food stamps and Medi-Cal and the, the number of people who are dependent on those programs and how we can really make some fundamental changes to those programs to increase the accessibility of those programs so that we don't have people starving in our community. You know, one of the things about Fresno uh, that is really kind of disappointing is in California, which is, you know, the most populous state in our country, uh, Fresno is number one for poverty mm. and, and one of every three and a half residents in Fresno is living in poverty. So what brings me to this race and what, what I really am focused on are speaking to my experiences um, in, in fixing the environment and expanding SNAP benefits, expanding access to, to, to healthcare uh, through Medicaid expansion um, these are, and, and then lowering the, the uh, age for, for Medicare, these are things that we can do that will make f real fundamental differences um, in people's lives. And they're things that are uh, really personal to me. Um, I lost my mother in my junior year of college 
um, to a, a situation where she had health insurance, but her deductible was so high that, hey, you might have health insurance, but if you can't come up with funds to pay a $10,000 deductible, you know, you're not really using that health insurance. If your health insurance doesn't cover your prescription medication, you're not getting those prescriptions. And that's because the situation that my mom found herself in. Um, and she ultimately made the choice to, you know, put money towards other bills like rent and paying back student loans and things like that. And it was a decision that ultimately cost her her life. And so I'm just standing up and saying, hey, where are our priorities in this country where we can talk about Martin Luther King Jr. one day and forget all the things that he talked about with poverty and militarism and materialism being the root cause of evil in this country? Yeah, there's there's so many things about the United States that make us a national or international rather embarrassment. I mean, the fact that we're the richest country on the planet and people in this country, thousands per year are dying simply because they don't have health care or maybe they do have health insurance, but they can't afford the deductible. As you stated, it's something that a lot of us don't necessarily talk about too much, but we should. It's it's really frustrating. So for me, I am somebody who's become a lot more cynical. I don't really have a lot of hope. One thing that I wanted to ask you about is you are seemingly optimistic, which I find good and commendable. I'm I'm cynical and that's bad. Uh, but in your <laughs> Twitter profile, the first thing that you put is proud Democrat. Now for me, I hate the Democratic Party and I am basically a uh, an individual who has no choice because I live in Oregon and this is a closed primary state. So if there's ever a progressive uh, presidential candidate, uh, who's running as a Democrat, I kind of have to be registered to vote for them. Um, so why, what makes you proud to be a Democrat? Is it a sense of, you know, this has always been my party? Is it a sense of, I think that I can still save the Democratic Party? What makes you proud to be a Democrat? Because I have the opposite feeling. You know, for me, I, I kind of fell into the, the that cynicism trap. And I, I kind of take away the lessons from my mom of of always looking at the glass half full um, hmm. I haven't always been a Democrat, though. I am originally this area is is um, conservative at its heart. Mm -hmm. And so I, I grew up being a Republican, actually, and having those Republican uh, ideas about freedom and opportunity and security. And growing up, actually, really embarrassing fact about me, my first the very first election I could vote in. I actually voted for Rudy Giuliani in the Republican Did you primary really? in 2008. <laughs> that was a long but, time ago. You can get a pass for that. But for, for me, um, you know, it, it's, it's with, with time has come uh, a little bit of perspective. And those things that um, I once thought the Republican Party stood for as far as freedom, um, security, and opportunity for all are really not those brands that they actually support. Um, when we talk about freedom, um, the freedom for people to marry who they love, the freedom to choose if a woman uh, decides with and with whom she has a child, um, those aren't freedoms that they support. Um, when we talk about opportunity, um, you know, opportunities to uh, have uh, uh, quality education as far as uh, uh, a publicly funded university system, um, having um, publicly funded vocational training. Those things give people opportunity. That's not something that the Republican Party supports. Um, and then security. Sure, they talk about uh, defense. And that's, that's you know, anytime that Republicans and Democrats are on board with defense, uh, my butt cheeks tighten a little bit because I go, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. this is just a big corporate grab when I look at the defense budget. Um, mm -hmm. But when we talk about security, we're talking about um, how about protecting the little guy? How about fighting for, for labor unions who are organizing so that their employees have a better life? How about balancing the playing field so that corporations um, aren't, aren't coming into an area like they are in my district, coming into an area, lowering the price of, of goods because they can take that loss until the mom and pop shops close. So for me, the, the Republican Party is a non-starter. Um, I was one of those folks that was really disenfranchised with or uh, disillusioned with the Democratic Party uh, in 2016. Um, and I, I've, I've had to come to, uh, not a come to Jesus moment, but a, a realization that for me, 
um, as a black man in, in this country, um, I don't have the, I don't have the luxury of waiting for a progressive platform, a progressive party to come along and actually have the institution uh, to be able to win elections so that we can see progress made. Um, I'm one of those folks that I, I this is the, the group that I'm running with. I'm going to pull them along with me, uh, kind of a kind of a take on the Democratic Party. But mm. I, I totally understand that the, the, the take of folks that are like, you know what, these are uh, parties are, are the problem in, in our in our government. Um, I just happen to think that the Democratic Party um, is one that is closer in line with my political alignment. And I, I'm not ready to give up on them yet. Mm. I was close. I, 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 I was close. I went and I registered no party preference in 2016. That's part of it. I did I too. Uh, yeah, I did too. I had to change it back though in 2020 to vote for Bernie, unfortunately. Yeah. No, uh, you know, I, I asked this because um, I, I think it's interesting the way that we um, view the Democratic Party. I think that it gives us insight into into the way that you would govern. Um, and, and for a lot of people, they make this choice, which is rational. You know, it, it's the Republican Party is so insane at this point, frankly, that they are, it, like you said, it's a non-starter. But some of the reasons why you're, disappointed with the Republican Party, such as military budgets, for example, Democrats also increased the military budget. So it's nice to know that, you know, this is kind of you're not accepting the Democratic Party as is. You do want to change the Democratic Party. For me, my perspective is that I always feel like, you know, I, I don't have a choice. The two party system in the United States is kind of the illusion of choice. You have both parties who are completely beholden to corporate donors. One of them is um, just late stage capitalist and the other is late stage capitalist and also crazy, quite literally, I think. I mean, there are members of the Republican Party who should not be in power at all, like Marjorie Greene. I, I think it scares oh me to think gosh, that that yeah. individual has power. So, yeah, it's, um, it, you know, it, it's it's an imperfect system, but I absolutely understand candidates running under the Democratic Party, because if you run third party, our institutions quite literally disenfranchise third party candidates. So it's kind of either you run with the Democrats and have a chance or you don't run with them and you have no chance. Uh, out of curiosity, what specifically would you change about the Democratic Party if you had a magic wand and you were in control? I mean, you're just if you were elected, you'd be just the one member of the House. I, but if you if you could change everything, if you were a benevolent dictator, what would you change immediately about the Democratic Party? One of the things that we're trying to do here in California, specifically for the California Democratic Party, is not taking fossil fuel money. The, mm. just, just be very open and transparent where our money and funding comes from. Because on the other side, we are going to we are getting attacked about you know money all the time. That George Soros is going and funding Antifa parties, and, and apparently George Soros has all this money to fund Antifa. Um, He's funding captain, me too, apparently. <laughs> right, as I was gonna say, as a, a captain in the uh, California Antifa squad. Uh, I'm not getting my paycheck yet, George. He is saying. Um, but you know, when you look, when you dive into it, a lot of the, these like crazy white right wing QAnon setups are funded by Republican billionaires. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that I mean, we talked forever about the Koch brothers for the last 10, 15 years about how crazy they they're, you know, their funding of the Tea Party and the Tea Party got spun out of hand. And now we have the QAnon folks. But I, I think being very specific and upfront about where our money comes from. Um, the, the second thing I would love to do, and this is kind of has bumped into my race here a little bit now that I'm, um, it's been announced that, uh, uh as elder statesman, if you will, Jim Costa, who is currently representing California's 16th congressional district, which is a neighboring district to this one, will be running in this district, um, mm, is that there is this, this party line, Hey, why don't you, uh, you know, you wait your, wait your turn. Or this, like, you know, this backroom dealing that this person's mm -hmm. the candidate, or this or that, or hey, wait that. for it, 2024, the change candidate, Hillary Clinton, coming back. <laughs> I'm so really like looking almost forward like to we that. We don't even get a choice yeah. in, in the matter. And just instead of presenting, it, it, it's really funny to me because Democrats, when we're talking about Republicans, you know, we always want to say, 
hey, the, you know, they don't engage with us on principles and on ideas and how we can have that back and forth and that dialogue about ideas and opinions, and that will move the country forward. But at the same time, within our own party, you know, we're not having those engagements uh, with each other. And that's mm -hmm. what really is kind of the, the needle that I'm trying to thread is mm -hmm. if you are a, a moderate Democrat, you have to have a realization that that left wing, that populism, that is where the future of the party lies. Right. OK, the, the, the younger people, they are more motivated. They are the ones that are knocking on doors. They're the ones that are making phone banking calls. I've tried to get a whole lot of other the older folks that hop on board to do stuff. And they're like, well, well you know, how about I give you a donation, which is fine. I love, I mean, I'll take money, of course. Mm -hmm. But those are the most, the, the younger folks are the ones that are engaged. You as a moderate Democrat are not going to win any more elections by just saying, these progressives, don't they know we, they need us? Mm -hmm. and, and not the other way around. It's a, it's a two-way street here. You need yeah. us. We need you. I'm willing to take a candidate who has uh, a lot of, uh, I don't want to say question marks, but I, I'm willing to take a candidate who, like a, like a Corey Lamb, who's like, he's, he has some progressive positions, but is like, you know, in that moderate streak, uh, over uh, someone like a Hillary Clinton. Mm. Uh, and I think <laughs> that needs to be the other way around too, is, for, is the moderate Democrats need to look at people in certain races and say, hey, you know what? This guy has the has all the folks, the grassroots folks, the, the, uh, the organizations are behind him, the young people are behind him. Um, let's fall in line with this guy and let's have that conversation as a party. See, I kind of feel I have a different approach to this and you can you can tell me your thoughts on this. I feel like the moderate and the left wing of the party, they're incompatible. And that's because the conflict isn't necessarily one of ideology. I mean, on the left, we have, you know, we're very strong. We adhere to our core principles and progressive values. But I don't actually think that's the case with the moderates. I think the moderates don't actually have any core philosophy. I think that it's all they're beholden to their corporate donors, and that's almost exclusively what drives their behavior. So when you have these competing interests, I don't think you can ever really find that alignment. And what that ends up what ends up happening is what we're seeing, where you have one wing of the party just trying to push the other side out. And I always hear Democrats talk about how this is a big tent party, but oftentimes I, I think that the party is too big. And it's so big right. that they allow Republicans in. But that tent isn't necessarily inclusive of left wing voices. So, you know, when you talk about issues with the Democratic Party, I do agree about the money issue and the funding. But I think that one critique that I have of Democrats who discuss the issue of money in politics is that if you just allow for more transparency, that doesn't necessarily solve the problem of corruption in American politics, because a lot of us know about the fact that Joe Manchin is an oil baron, a modern day coal baron, right. taking $500,000 per year. Kirsten Cinema, you know, she ran on prescription drug costs being lower. She took so much money from the pharmaceutical industry, I, I think north of a million, and now she's against that. So it, it's such a corrupting influence that I don't think transparency is enough. I think you have to just eliminate it from the party, but the Democratic Party will never do that. So my question to you is, how do we how do we do this? How do how do we reconcile these irreconcilable differences between the moderates who are corrupt, in my opinion, and the leftists who are just trying, but they don't have the institutional power. All they have is grassroots support. But as we've seen in the past, you know, like in 2016, how you were disappointed, the Democratic Party establishment, they have the institutional tools needed to crush that. So how do you how do you reconcile that? And this is a huge qu question. So I understand that it's, it's you know, there's there's no one right or wrong answer <laughs> to this. But how do you reconcile right. that? Right. And I think that's like, you know, a, the thing that I've tried to grapple with and the needle that I've tried to thread is that like as a progressive, I know, well, I won't say I know I'm right, but there's a lot of issues that we are on the right side of history on. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a litmus test, um, you know, that's that's fine. I'm willing to to have that, you know, be in place. Uh, it's that time and time again, um, we lose. <laughs> And I'm so mm. tired yeah. of, of, 
of losing that I want I want to win just one race on those principles to show that we can do it, that we have that that uh, election ability, that electability um, to win elections based on on our, our values alone. Um, at the end of the day, I think that you know we live in a country where um, Citizens United is the law of the land. And mm. um, at, at the end of the day, I understand it takes money to win elections. I get yeah. it. But um, damn, if I don't like hate losing <laughs> every time. Yeah. And, that, you know, and that's, that's the that's, thing. We're just going to be like, oh, we died, but we were right. And I just. No, I, I you're right. That. It's the core yeah. issue for leftist candidates because the conundrum is, you know, we're the principled ones. You know, the candidates who I talk to, they take zero corporate dollars. But simultaneously, everyone acknowledges that without a lot of money, you lose. I mean, a, a lot of these races, nine times out of 10, they're determined basically uh, by who raises the most amounts of money. So it's difficult. Let me ask you this. It's kind of a hypothetical situation. So I know that you are, you're, you're principled. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're taking grassroots donations exclusively. But let's say, a benevolent billionaire comes along and he says, listen, Lauren, I really like your platform. And I think that what you're doing is, is fantastic. I'm going to give you, uh, I'll, I'll form, have you form a super PAC. And then, uh, you know, maybe I will donate $2 million to that super PAC. What do you do in that instance? Do you reject that money specifically because it comes from a billionaire and it's hard to shake that? I mean, we're all human beings, right? It's, it's hard to, right pass policies and vote on policies that might tax billionaires more if you take that money. Maybe you're more sympathetic to them, even a little bit. And maybe you don't acknowledge this, but perhaps subconsciously. Or do you reject it and remain principled, knowing that your chances of getting elected will be a lot uh, a lot worse? Uh, what do you do in that instance? Because this is a real question that uh, I think a lot of people uh, have to ask themselves You know, before going to Congress. Yeah, and it's actually kind of a situation that I'm currently in where mm. I have I have contacts with people who are uh, CEOs of of mega corporations, media mm. corporations. Um, and I have not asked them for money for that specific reason. We've talked about the race mm -hmm. and how things are going, but I've not made that that reach out there. And it's to the to the point where uh, some of the people on my campaign are like, Hey, well, don't you, I mean, don't you want to reach out to, to, to your, your person there? And, um, I, I, I have it for the reason that you just said, it's very hard to balance. Um, it's really hard to, 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 to take money from someone and then say, Hey, well, I'm going to raise your taxes. Although I do think that's like kind of the, the, on the on the flip side, it's kind of the message that we how we talk to uh, um, uh, white working class voters the same way. It's like, oh, what, what's what's wrong with you? Don't you know that uh, Democrats or or this party is is working to improve your economic outlook, um, and they consistently vote against their own economic interest um, time and time again. And it's because they value something else, whether it's, you know, white supremacy or I'm just floating that. I don't know. It mm -hmm. could be one, a contributing factor. But on, on the flip side, you know, for us, I'm talking to folks uh, don't do my donor call time every day, talking to folks mm -hmm. that make I mean, they're not millionaires, but they're some of them are and some of them are really wealthy. And they're giving me money, contributing to our campaign um, because their values lie with something other than money. And so I mm -hmm. think in every situation, especially in the situation that, that we're talking about where uh, uh, a person, if it was like Michael B. Jordan, he was like, hey, Lauren, hey, man, I, I love what you're doing. I, I, I'm going to say, hey, Michael B., but maybe don't give me to me like that, but put me in your next movie and let me hold a campaign sign. <laughs> but I think it, 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 everything depends on the source. Uh, yeah. Uh, to yeah. Me. I I would agree with that because, I mean, if you have a celebrity maxing out, giving you $2,700, I think that's a lot – that's so different, you know, compared to um, the CEO of some media conglomerate 
who is donating a million dollars to a super PAC. You know, this is all untraceable money. This is all money that over time will corrupt. I think that a lot of politicians, they are running and initially they, they are progressive, like Nancy Pelosi, for example. A lot of people don't know she supported single payer when she was first elected to Congress. And oh. now she's raised more than a billion dollars in uh, political contributions over her career. And she is one of the most corrupt politicians in America. So uh, I think that people, they run for Congress and they think, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be like other people. I'll take this money, but that doesn't mean I'm going to, you know, betray my principles. But with time, you know, being in D.C. so long, I mean, AOC talks about how you have all these sources in your ear. Influences try to drag you in one way and then another way. And it's almost overwhelming. Um, and I think that with time, it's just the human response to succumb to that because it's easier. You're tired. People in Congress, you know, for as many vacations as they take, you know, when they are there actually legislating, it can be really difficult. You have to read a lot of bills, at least if you care. I mean, we all know that people like Louis Gomer exactly. are not reading anything. But, um, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's a lot of work if you care. Right. So I, exactly. I think it is important. I, I, I I'm glad that there's more of an emphasis emphasis on money in politics, especially given this day and age where um, it's, you know, we have billionaires, for example, like Michael Bloomberg, who tried to buy their way to the White House and he didn't, you know, yeah. make it. Thankfully, I mean, we didn't get someone that much better, but I mean, he didn't make it. But just the fact that that's possible in our system kind of shows how far we've fallen as a country, how much we've right. commodified elections and why that's such a bad thing. Um, so real quick, before we go, can you tell us basically a little bit about the dynamics of this race? How many people are running in this primary? Um, how many people on the Republican side have entered? What does it look like in terms of competition? Because I know that sometimes these races can get really crowded, especially if they are for high profile seats. I mean, Devin Nunes' seat, everyone kind of knows about that. So is there a lot of people in this race? Um, we're currently running in a special election that has north of six candidates in it. Okay. Um, okay. So with myself, there's three uh, Democratic uh, candidates running. Uh, myself and um, uh, another candidate for this uh, seat. He's basically been running for Congress for three years. Oh wow! Uh, I, I he, he ran against Nunes in 2020, lost, and immediately said, "Hey, I'm gonna run again." And I could understand mm -hmm. if it was a situation where he was like, you know, razor thin margins where he was really close, but he was, I think he lost by eight and a half points. And the person mm -hmm. before him lost by five. Mm -hmm. you, you, to me, he wasn't a strong candidate, which is why um, I decided to run in this race. The other uh, uh, person in this race is uh, Eric Garcia. He is a also a Democrat. Don't know a lot about him. I think I've never met him in any of the uh, events that we go through, through the uh, whether it's through the local party or in any of the other organizations that are uh, working in our district. So I can't say anything about him. Um, I will talk about Elizabeth Hang, though. She is a, a Republican who is running. Uh, she ran in 2018 against Jim Costa and lost. Um, she was going to challenge uh, Padilla for his U.S. Senate seat here in California and subsequently decided she was going to run instead. Um, mm. She's a, another one of those people that is... Uh, um, you know, thinks that the electorate is dumb and that they we can run any kind of nonsense ad and that they will buy it. Um, so she was uh, is kind of known here in the area for running uh, basically an ALC attack ad at our uh, AAA baseball stadium during games. And that's her mm -hmm. like, claim to fame. Um, is she one of those then, Republicans who like will print out a bill and then shoot it? Like, is she doing that with the Green New Deal? Yeah. Yeah, like the ridiculous, most off-the-wall, computer-generated <laughs> explosions and everything else. Love it. Love it. Um, <laughs> the other, the other, other gentleman is a uh, 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 county board of supervisor currently. Um, Nathan Magsig is his name. And he is uh, trying to walk the line of being Trump- but not. Mm. We're that seeing that we're seeing that sense. balancing act by a lot of Republicans yeah, as of late, which a, is interesting. Like a Glenn Youngkin kind of. Yeah. Like talk yeah. The talk, but 
you know, not not mention Trump by name, but talk about his policies, mm. and I'll do the same thing. But uh... yeah, that's interesting. Um, um, tell me about um, because you know it's, it's kind of interesting to know what's going on. I mean, this is a, a GOP leaning district, but in terms of the the Democratic Party primary, how would you say you're different than the other candidates? Um, and there's a lot of people jumping in, so I'm sure it's kind of difficult to, to keep up. But just broadly speaking, like, why why are you different than the rest of them? Why do you think that people should vote for you over the other candidates, in your opinion? Well, so the, 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 the thing is, the district has kind of really changed with redistricting, where we were a plus mm. five Republican advantage, uh, registration advantage district, to now being a plus seven Democratic registration advantage district. So mm, the district okay. itself is very democratic. And one of the things I think is oh. the misconception is a lot of the folks that they added through redistricting, uh, just because they're a registered Democrat, doesn't mean they're going to show up and vote. They're, they're very much um, uh, uh, low income people of color. The traditional people that would be prime for the Democratic Party to pick off, but uh we've had candidates that don't speak to their issues. And so I think what's different with mm. about me is the same thing that we talked about, about the, the millionaire and, and with you take that money. Like my mother, who's not here to fight for herself. That's something I, that's, that's buried in me and that I'm not going to lose. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, the issue is it becomes talking about the things that people are concerned with because they're the same things I'm concerned with. My wife is a registered nurse. We've been living the two years in a pandemic and mm. situation where she doesn't have PPE going into work or uh -oh. but right now they're trying to do contact tracing and she's got 180 something cases. Um, our, our, our community hospital here uh, has 700 employees that are out because they've tested positive. Wow. Wow. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, yeah. So with the, the situation that we have on the ground here, um, not only with COVID, but in the situation that I talked about with, with, with poverty and everything else, um, those things are not being talked about by any mm -hmm. of the other candidates. Um, you know, we get a lot of these, I, I call them platitudes where it's like, yeah, I, I support people having access to healthcare. Like, that's, a, that's such it, a bad code word. Yeah. I have access to health. Everybody, homeless people have access to health care now. doesn't mean yeah. that they can, that they're getting the care that they need. We're talking about preventative mm -hmm. care. Um, I'm talking about my grandma being able to go to the doctor before she gets diabetes. Um, you know, that's the kind of things that we're talking about. Um, you know, as a person, I got student loans. I understand one of the things I, I've advocated for on social media is okay. I get that you know, Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin, they're bumps on a log. They're not going to do anything. Let's look at the executive action that Biden could take. If you're really talking about improving the lives of Americans, what's some executive action that you can take? Um, yeah. Do you know the sort of stimulus that having uh, student loans? We've been we, they've been you know on pause for this long, just without them. I mean, geez yeah. Louise. Yeah, um, it, it, it's it's a simple solution that's so pop that would make them so popular, it would make Biden specifically more popular. It, it's 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 frustrating to know that that's not uh, with the something he's the doing. Pain. Yeah, yeah, and, it's, and it's ridiculous. Just look like you're doing something. Like, well, you know, we're, we 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 had a today about about fifty uh, about you know forgiving fifty thousand dollars in student debt, and not it was this this and this person, and we're really going to see if we can do just. You know, look like you're doing something that's the most frustrating thing is as a candidate and i'm just waiting for somebody to tell me what does the democratic party stand for i know what this person who's a democrat stands for i know what this person who's a democrat stands for what does the democratic party stand for if you don't want to lose the house in 2022 give us something to run on because right now mm -hmm. i'm the only person talking about these issues that affect everyday people and I, i've met with a lot of cynicism because we didn't get built back better because the bipartisan infrastructure bill yeah. was a corporate slush fund, there's some stuff yeah. in it that helps. But um, you know, it's it, it, what are the tangible things that I can go out and I tell somebody, hey, you know, we're, I'm running for office, and these are the things that I would love to see happen, and that I'm going to work for. 
And at the same time, we're watching stuff on the on the news every night. Uh, Democrats tried again to pass voting rights. Things that you would think would be so fundamental, and yeah. we can't get it done. So, uh, as a as a leader of the party, I would love for Joe Biden to stand up and say, "Okay, you know what? We're going to do this stuff without these people. This is what I can do by executive action. If you give me a, a full majority, a greater majority." Look at how much more we will get done. Look like you're doing something. So much of this is stuff that I've learned from Trump. He was really good at looking like he was doing something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, his daily schedule, he worked for maybe, you know, three hours of the day. He had a Mm -hmm. call, then had some executive time, had lunch. Fox News, uh, marathon every day. Yeah, no, I, I've heard yeah, similar yeah. things about how, you know, um, back in uh, 2020, a lot of the candidates running then were really trying to win uh, when it was like an uphill battle. Because once, you know, Bernie had dropped out, all of the enthusiasm had kind of been deflated. And then it was just, OK, Joe Biden isn't Trump. And that's something. But it's kind of hard to get people excited about that. And you're kind of describing the same um, characteristic, which is. It's frustrating. Uh, So here's what I want to do. I want to give you the opportunity to kind of uh, plug your campaign. Let us know how we can help you get elected. Uh, Do you need any donations? Do you need volunteers? Um, And is there anything we can do to send like your wife a care package? Because, oh, my God, being a nurse during a (laughs) pandemic, I don't know how she's doing it. The fact that she's still doing it in the third wave now, send her all of our love uh, because I I just I'm not mentally strong enough to do it. So she is she's got to be heroic. Um, So so let us know how we can help you, though. Yeah, I mean, we, we totally appreciate every every dollar that we get goes straight into outreach. Um, so if you want to be able to to help us reach voters in this district, um, I'm, I'm one of those people. I'm working full time while I'm doing this, too. Um, and so uh, I'm not taking a, a salary from my campaign, unlike some of the other candidates. We are putting all, every dollar that we get into um, into our campaign. So if you want to go. Uh, and make a contribution to our campaign, you can do so at lh, the number four, c.com, or go to www.laurenhubbard, L-O-U-R-I-N-H-U-B-B-A-R-D.com. And on our website, you can check out our platform for progress, all the things that we're talking about uh, to really move the country forward. Because we, that much, that's our, our whole campaign is based on, we deserve better. How about making some investments in us? And especially after the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday uh, this week where people were talking about, oh, Dr. King this and Dr. King that and and forget that he talked about a country that invests more in its military than the social investments in its citizens does not need to exist. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's the basis of our platform. We invest in America, invest in us. We deserve it. We deserve better. Um, and then if you want to reach out to my wife at Hubbard family <laughs> on Instagram, uh, cause we have two kids. One of them's here now making all kinds of noise. <laughs> you want to say hi to people? She's in the background running around. We got two kids, <laughs> five and two, and one of them's here now. She's our campaign mascot. Hi, oh, Maddie. hi. And so my wife has been fantastic. She is taking the kids. She's doing this. She's going to events with me. She's got all of this stuff going on with COVID. She, it's you have your hands a, full. A family campaign. <laughs> yeah, you all have your hands full. I mean, how, how could you not vote for someone who is bringing on an adorable child like this? That's I adorable. <laughs> Hi. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we'll be following your campaign closely and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.